Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and good morning for those of you on the West Coast. Uh, I'm Suzanne Collins. I'm the head of marketing here at City National Rockdale, and welcome to our client and advisor forum. I'm excited to introduce today's webinar, the 2018 Mid-Year Market and Economic Update, the Battle Royale in the Financial Markets. Presenting today is Matt Perrone, Chief Investment Officer, uh, Tom Galvin, Senior Portfolio Manager for U.S. Equities, Dave Abella, Senior Portfolio Manager for Dividend and Income Equities, and Greg Kaplan, Director of Fixed Income. Links to each of the speakers' biographies are included in the speaker widget on your console screen. Just a few logistics before we get started today. We've got a full agenda. We encourage you to ask questions by typing them into your console's Q&A window at any time during the session. We're going to address questions at the end of the presentation. We're going to try to get to as many as possible in the time that we have allotted. Also, please note that a copy of the slides can be downloaded from the resources window to the right of your console screen. Now for the presentation. Matt? Battle Royale is defined as a fight among many combatants. I'll hand things over to you to discuss how this describes the markets today. Matt? Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, it certainly does describe the market today. Um, the multiple combatants is uh, certainly an, uh, an apt uh, analogy, I guess. And so uh, we are going to go through it all today, uh, talk about the puts and takes in the market, what's going on, back and forth. We'll start with an economic update and uh, then uh, move to our asset class experts to talk about their asset classes in some detail. And then we'll wrap it up at the end with our uh, strategy, tie it all together, and our outlook. So we want to keep today forward-looking um, because we all know what's happening. We're all following the, the, the daily, so we won't spend a lot of time on what has happened um, but I will just note that uh, it is kind of remarkable that uh, if you pay attention to all the headlines, you'd say, wow, the market probably would be in trouble. But if you uh, just tuned out all the noise and you look at the market's up uh, almost 3% year to date, that's quite an amazing feat given all that we've thrown at the market. But it certainly has been a tumultuous path to get to that 3%. Um, and of course, not all markets have, have participated, especially those outside the U.S., um, but relatively speaking, I think the market has, as, we, as we've talked about in the past, been able to tune out the noise to a certain extent and focus on uh, what are, especially in the U.S., strong fundamentals. So um, with that, we'll, we'll walk, uh, walk through how we see it. Okay, so as Suzanne mentioned, we've upgraded our topic from a very, uh, very gentle navigating the cross currents, which was our beginning of the year uh, title to a full-out battle royale. And um, battle royale, is, as Suzanne mentioned, is a, is a battle with multiple combatants. And those combatants are listed on the page here. Uh, and I'll walk, we'll walk through them, uh, many of these themes today. Um, but I think um, we really are in a, in a battle royale. There's just so much going on between secular and cyclical forces. Um, it's really more of a scrum or a rumble or something, but uh, Suzanne wouldn't let us uh, use more uh, more graphic descriptions. So here we are with a uh, battle royale, at which in polite company, hopefully we'll uh, we'll get the job done. But heretofore, the the positives have really outweighed the ne the negatives in this cycle, and as a result, the um, the market has been uh, you know as uh, well documented. It's slow grind up. Um, and to, to nice, um, I think, above uh, typical returns in the past few years that we've enjoyed. And we think that that's about to change, and we'll go in, of course, to those reasons as, as the battle between these positives and the negatives uh, start to really get more evened out. Um, uh, we still think the positives have the upper hand, as we'll explain, but it certainly is going to be uh, a more tumultuous uh, time to get to uh, gains, which I'd put another way, is harder to come by. We do want to focus on the left. I won't go through all of them now, but on the left, the strong corporate profit growth really, in my view, uh, dominates uh, a, a lot of um, the positives. And if I was to single one out, that's probably the best one. And on the negatives, uh, Fed tightening is probably the one that uh, ultimately is going to be binding although, of course, there are a lot of other headlines to pay attention to, but that is just typical as we get later cycle. We'll see higher volatility, 
um, as we get to the neutral rate in in Fed funds, um, that will start to become less accommodative and, and move even potentially into restrictive. So that is going to be something we're going to be watching very closely. So uh, many of you are familiar with our speedometers, um, and, we, and thanks to our marketing team, we have a very new look and feel, um, much more uh, in, in line with the times. Um, so um, the main point on this slide is that our indicators remain positive, especially when you look at the U.S. indicators. 17 of 20 are positive. I think that those of you who know us know that there are over 100 indicators that we track and quantitative measures and, and qualitative measures that we track that are underneath these. Uh, so um, a lot goes into these speedometers, but we summarize them here for you. And at the end of the day, if you're dispassionate and just look at the facts, uh, the speedometers are actually in good shape in terms of the U.S. economy. I'll highlight two of them, uh, the global economic outlook. We have that in green, but just barely green, because uh, certainly uh, things have decelerated uh, outside the U.S. Uh, they're not going into um, uh, negative territory yet, or hopefully not, hopefully they won't, but they're flatlining at best and some deceleration for sure. So we're watching that one, of course, uh, and that's playing out in the um, markets outside the U.S. And, of course, geopolitical risk with the talk about tariffs, et cetera, certainly been a concern from foremost for us, so, uh, and we're going to talk about that in a few slides, but that's certainly on the, uh, on the radar for us and a uh, subject of some, a lot of research we're doing, and we'll, we'll have updates for you uh, today and in the coming weeks. But that one is red, so we're, we're, we're watching that. But other than that, uh, let's not lose sight of the fact that the fundamentals in the U.S. are good or strong, um, and that keeps us grounded in how we think this will impact markets. In April, we did a more uh, deep dive into the economic backdrop. Uh, we've attached that presentation, which for the most part is still valid today. So that goes through a, um, a fairly detailed buildup as to why we think this uh, cycle has more to come, more to, to run uh, in the probably 18 months or perhaps longer. And we got, got at that in a, a number of ways in that webinar. Um, I pulled one slide from that to, to bring it to the fore if I had to pick one, but there are, there are many. And basically, um, we talk about the on the left the length of the business cycle and how remarkably long this has been. But uh, time is not really the best measure of the business cycle, and, and instead we refer you to the chart on the right, which is the um, output gap. And this is the difference between potential and actual GDP. And we're just closing the output gap. And typically, uh, that means that there's a few years to run before the cycle gets too old uh, or the Fed has to end the cycle, et cetera. So that's um, just one measure, uh, that, uh, but I thought the most germane uh, in terms of uh, bringing that to the fore in the economic context. So putting it all together, the point of our uh, work on the economics is that the recession risk is low in the U.S. And while um, there's some small risk that the trade talks could increase this measure at that point, at this point we're not ready to make that call. Um, but certainly we, we, we are monitoring it every day and there's news back and forth every day, a little good news today, not so good yesterday, et cetera. Uh, so, but, but again, because of the strong fundamentals, we think the U.S. recession risk is low. And this is very important because it informs our market call. So we have to lay this foundation. It's the bottom of our building blocks approach. And if we have this foundation, then it, a lot of things in our market outlook uh, hangs from that. So um, and important to, to measure that we put it all together. Again, over 100 indicators behind this um, that we are tracking. Uh, to come to this, uh, this this conclusion at this point. Okay, so we we have to talk about trade um, some because it's really in the news. It's a very complex and fluid situation. Um, I'll lay the economic context now. Tom Galvin will talk about it in terms of our earnings buildup and how it might affect their uh, several scenarios that he'll run through. But I want to talk through two different graphs just to just to 
to level set everybody and to keep keep it grounded. On the top, you have what are threatened and imposed, and not all threatened um, tariffs, of course, actually get imposed, and there's carve-outs and uh, exceptions and et cetera. So we have no idea, but the number could be a lot smaller than the gray bars as it currently sits, or it, or it could go to an all-out trade war and these bars grow higher. So those are obviously the two boundary conditions, if you will, um, a severe case or a, um, a, a um, rather subdued case. Right now, so far, we don't have a lot that's actually imposed, but of course the, the rhetoric of late is, is certainly uh, concerning. Um, but we have to keep in mind um, the impact on GDP, just to, just to level set that. We just had a big stimulus come into the market through the tax cuts, and on the lower right, we size so far what could be the potential um, in terms of the, the relative uh, benefit of the tax cuts. So we'd give back a significant portion of that as we sit now. And again, of course, there's the potential for it to get worse. Um, we think people know uh, those the, the the negotiations, those involved, I should say, know this, and there's a lot of posturing going on, but certainly um, the talk of late has been getting more serious. But even if the, the some of the worst cases come to pass, um, keep in mind that the supply chains uh, in the modern economy are very complex, um, and they're also uh, somewhat flexible. I, you know, I can think of two examples. Um, one is the, you know, when the earthquake hit in Japan, how a lot of semiconductor fabs had to move their uh, their fab, their sourcing to second sources. Uh, I should say semiconductor customers had to move their sourcing as the fabs went down in Japan. And the second sourcing was uh, up and running in a few months. So we, the supply chain is built for redundancy in many cases, especially in tech. Obviously, for washing machines, et cetera, it's, it's harder to uh, do something like that, but uh, certainly people keep that in mind. Uh, for those who have some free time on their hands, you may want to take a history lesson and, and go to Wikipedia and search for the term chicken tax because um, that details a 40-year saga on the unintended consequences and the back, back and forth of how tariffs uh, can work and play out over a long period of time. This was a tax that was uh, enacted in 1965, and even today some of it survives as a tax on light trucks. So go figure uh, how that uh, played out. So I doubt anyone in, in, when they were having their webinar in 1965 predicted that here in 2018 we'd still be talking about the chicken tax. So very, very hard to predict. Uh, but, of course, the, the, the net effect of it, the reason why no one's heard of it, is because the net effect of it has been mitigated over time. And you'll see some of the crazy ways that that, that was achieved if you actually read the article. So I'll close out my comments here by saying that we are not complacent on this issue. We're watching it. Uh, we've noticed that the new, order CP, uh, the new orders uh, in the PMI have ticked down, so that's concerning to us. Now, that could be a dollar effect. There could be other things going on. We've noted that washing machine prices are up 17%. That's probably a direct impact from the tariffs. So there are uh, signals to watch, uh, but at this point, um, we're still staying with our view that this uh, will be managed somehow with some, and we're putting in some uh, impact into earnings, as Tom will talk about, uh, but not the most dire case just yet. I think the markets uh, come to that view as well. Finally, um, on the um, the economic output, just to s summarize our this and uh, close on this last section here, we still see positive economic fundamentals. But as we look into 2019. The market, the sorry, the economy and earnings will decelerate. Uh, I think the market knows that. Um, we have a view that it will probably decelerate maybe a little bit more than the market thinks. Um, so we have that view and that understanding. But um, and we and we'll talk about how we get to our build up there in coming uh, slides. But you can see on the page that our new 2019 uh, estimates uh, certainly have a deceleration in. GDP and in corporate profit growth, and a slight rise in the 10-year Treasury, which Greg will talk about in his section. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom Galvin uh, to talk about, kick us off on the uh, equities asset class. Tom? Thank you, Matt, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, 
So far, um, equity fundamentals and stock returns are performing in line with our original expectations for the year. That is, a year of solid profit growth, moderate equity returns, increased volatility. Our original view called for earnings growth of around 12 to 14 percent, and while we've raised our forecast in recent months as more details on the tax cuts have become clearer, we are currently anticipating um, 16 to 18 percent growth, another slight increase, um, as benefits for higher revenues, higher tax cuts, buybacks, and oil are, are all coming in stronger than anticipated. We're also expecting uh, an increase in volatility coming into the year with normal corrections, quote unquote, of 10 percent. Uh, uh, to occur, and indeed after a very strong start to the year for equity returns, the market did experience a 10% correction and has been locked in this tug of war, the battle royale, um, given all these factors that Matt just uh, discussed. As we look into the second half of 2018, we believe volatility will remain high, especially until there is greater clarity on the trade and tariff issues, the outcome of the midterm elections in the U.S. The battle royale between strong fundamentals and low recession risk versus macro influences and uncertainty could increase in the uh, short term. Uh, ne negotiations are never an, an easy um, uh, topic, but nevertheless, we believe a PE in the range of 18 and a half to 19 for the S&P 500 is appropriate um, and, um, and uh, uh, represents uh, 2,900 fair value for the S&P by the end of the year. Um, so that's about um, a slight increase over where we're coming in for the uh, beginning part of the year. Bottom line, we think the risks of recession are low and believe that barring an unexogenous shock, the secular bull market will continue and become the longest running bull market in history. Now, the foundation of our positive view towards stocks remains the positive outlook for EPS growth. As I said earlier, we raised our EPS forecasts in January from 12 to 14 to 16 to 18 as we sit today. Um, as you can see at the top of our building blocks chart, the benefits from the tax cuts is likely to add 8% to our outlook, a bit higher than our original view. Uh, GDP outlook for the U.S. is somewhat higher too, approximating 3%. Inflation uh, around 2% or so. So you add those two up, you get 5% uh, for nominal GDP, which is a relatively good proxy for domestic revenue growth. To this, we add approximately 0.4% uh, um, as international GDP is faster than the U.S. It's uh, decelerating, but still faster. Uh, and as a result, global revenue should rise 5 to 5.5% um, during this time frame. We've also bumped up our expectations to the impact of oil from a positive 1 to a positive 2% as WTI prices have remained higher, and we're currently assuming WTI at 60 for the balance of the year. Our dollar impact has shifted to the modestly positive side, and the benefits of a weaker dollar on Q1 EPS was pronounced and should help counter uh, balance the recent strength we've seen in the greenback. As a result of the stronger earnings and cash flow, stock buybacks are likely to be stronger than expected, increasing about 3.5%. On the negative front, despite uh, positive operating leverage evident in Q1, we believe margins are likely to be reduced modestly based on rising input costs, rising tariff costs, and uh, wages uh, going up uh, modestly. Finally, given the recent escalation in the tariffs, we have assumed a, a negative impact of around 1%. Um, add it all up, we, we, we do see EPS growth of 16 to 18% uh, for the year 17, as you can see on the slide there. Now, just to spend a minute on, on tariffs as it relates to S&P 500 earnings. So the headline of $50 billion, uh, in products, 25% tariffs on Chinese goods coming into the U.S. does sound like a big number. But when you dig into it, it's really not. Uh, the math on the tariffs, that 25% on $50 billion is about $10 billion. In 2017, the S&P 500 generated approximately 1.2 trillion, with a T trillion, in net income. The 17% growth rate in earnings were forecasted for 2018 is an increase of roughly $200 billion. So the hit on tariffs is approximately 5%. <clears throat> Assume a half a year impact and that companies will be able to pass along roughly 50% of the higher tariffs to customers is how we come up with the 1% number. Now, if uh, trade tensions worsen and we get up into that $200 billion uh, tariff level, then it is going to be a, a bigger hit, uh, per, perhaps 5% or so. 
So what does it all mean for stocks? Um, if you see on this chart, our 16 to 18% growth rate translates into earnings for the uh, S&P of a range of 153 to 157. One of the strongest growth rates in many years. Uh, given the strong economic backdrop and low inflation outlook, the PE for the market, we believe, should trade around 18.5 to 19. Using our 155 as the base case, we believe projected fair value for the market is around 2,900, about 100 points higher than we were projecting in uh, January. And this chart, which was um, um, taking the returns as the, the close on Monday after the sell-off, would, would, would produce a return from that point of around uh, 8 to 10 percent in total returns to fair uh, uh, value. Now, why our fair, our fair value is somewhat higher than our earlier forecast, we do think it's uh, prudent to continue to expect moderate returns over the next several years. Uh, shifting back to tariffs for a minute, uh, if you assume the 10 percent decline in the uh, S&P's uh, peak has been all about trade concerns, then approximately $2 trillion has come off the market capitalization of the S&P 500. Compare that to the $10 billion net income hit we outlined earlier, or even the potential of a $50 billion hit, the market seems to have discounted all but a worst-case basis as it re relates to tariffs and uh, China. So now while forecasting earnings can be made um, um, somewhat accurately, coming up with uh, PEs can be a, a trickier um, um, assignment. So if you look to this slide, you can see on the left side, PE multiples can be strongly um, helped uh, by a stronger economy, increased confidence inflows into stocks and lower level of uh, interest rates. On the negative side, uh, trade wars um, can have a negative impact as it uh, uh, brings down uh, the uh, visibility that people have towards their earnings, creates more uncertainties. So that's a, a negative as it relates to, to PEs. Uh, the the midterm elections are coming up. History shows that stocks tend to go sideways. Uh, during this uh, time frame, so that's a, another uh, concern that could uh, keep stocks in the sideways trading uh, fashion. Uh, lastly, uh, the uh, inflation impacts or uh, deficit spending, and to the extent that that can raise interest rates, does tend to have a dampening influence on, on PEs. But nevertheless, we, we think the fundamental backdrop is uh, solid uh, for earnings. Uh, we think uh, trade wars are to be uh, watchful, but uh, don't lose too much sleep over it. And we do think that this secular bull market is likely to continue, albeit with uh, more moderate uh, returns uh, going forward. So with that, I'll stop and turn it over to David Bella for some insights on high dividend and income. Uh, Dave? Um, thank you, Tom, for that. So I will get right into it. Uh, as of the, the mid-year, um, we uh, are continuing with our one-year forward expected return of 6 to 8%. So um, that's a question I'm often asked about, what the returns are. And we, we like to really um, kind of uh, go one year forward. And the 6 to 8% total return is driven on a, a mid-4% um, yield kind of 4.5-ish uh, percent, and then our expected growth of the dividend of 4 to 7 percent. So that, that part of it's very important. Uh, there's continued worry, and that's uh, some questions, and continued worry over potentially higher interest rates and then the overall concern of a higher rate environment in general. And our operating assumption is that we will be in a higher rate environment and it will continue and we look to be properly positioned for such an environment. Having said that, in our past research, we have found that dividend stocks can do well in a higher rate environment, provided that the economy is growing. So if the reason for higher rates is a stronger economy, that will drive our company's earnings growth as well, which should drive dividend growth. Um, that would be different than if rates go up in, in a flat economy, what's known um, as stagflation. Uh, that's not our, our base assumption. Our assumption is that rates would go up in, in response to a good economy, and our, our companies uh, are like other companies in that they do well in, in, in a good economy. The main drivers of our research are to remain comfortable with the aggregate level of the dividend, 
So that means the safety of the dividend. Uh, in other words, no no cuts to the dividend um, over the 15 plus years that that I've been doing this. Um, that is really uh, uh, my and our team's proudest achievement is the stability of the dividend. Um, so that is something that Income Stream we're looking to be very um, confident in. And then from there, we want to make sure that the stocks that make up our portfolio have a, an attractive valuation and, a, and an attractive aggregate dividend yield, given what's available in in the market as well as what the current rate environment is, and then again, that safety of the dividend. So our focus um, on dividend growth is the median term dividend cycle and what that means is kind of the next two to four years um, we don't necessarily want something that's just going to increase the dividend a lot one or two years and kind of maybe right size their dividend and but it, we're, we're really looking for more of a, a steady state growth that that's attractive but with an eye to market events and conditions there's some noise out there such as um, you know if rates go too high too fast that affects uh, markets beyond high dividend and income and and some of the tariff noise um, so that those are conditions to watch but having said that the economic environment it currently is very favorable for our companies uh, the next um, slide is, is something just to kind of go a little deeper into the dividend growth um, our actual year-over-year -year dividend growth of the stocks that make up our our universe um, uh, grew 7.2% in the last year, and that's excluding financial stocks. And the reason we pulled financial stocks out is some of our newer financial names had very big dividend increases that we don't feel is, is uh, an ongoing steady state growth that so we wanted to to, to, to pull those out, and um, that was a 7.2. That's higher than in years past. That's the highest uh, I remember it. It's usually more in the five, five-ish range. And um, then the middle uh, graph shows the projected earnings over the next two years, and these are published earnings by analysts that cover the stocks. Through um, we picked it up through FactSet, but they're they're the publicly um, stated. Earnings expectations are, are for 11% uh, earnings growth each year. So that's very, very attractive growth, definitely benefiting from the growth in the economy and definitely benefiting from the, the tax cut. Um, and then the dividend growth in the uh, 4 to 7% range, so that third column is a two, two-colored column with the, the 4, the, the kind of the low range and the, the the top part of it, the high range. Um, having said that, to come up with our low range of, of um, 4%, that would mean every single stock, 100% of them, uh, have dividend growth in, in their low range. So if we had a range of, say, 3 to 8 on some stock or 4 to 9 on another, when you take the average at, at the low end of all of them, that, that became 4%. So overall, we, we have some... A degree of confidence it, it will be um, kind of on the higher end of that, but that that is our range, and that's uh, that's very important um, for for two main reasons. One is having that growth uh, takes advantage of the growth in the um, economy and tax bill to help drive total return over time, and two it mitigates against. Uh, Risks of rising rates. That that was the the probably the single biggest worry um, with our strategy and what we focused on in our um, HDI webinar, which uh, was a couple months ago. And and our stocks um, did have a, an effect. It, there is always kind of a short term trading effect um, on on rising rates. And so what we're uh, trying to do is, or what we did do, is actually get that dividend growth rate higher to really take advantage of, of the economy and, and the tax tax bill. So if you have a 5% growth rate on average, five years down the road, the aggregate level of dividend is 28% higher, and that really does go a long way to um, easing up some of the interest rate worry. Next couple of uh, slides, just to pull out a couple of sectors um, that uh, 
people um, have asked about. There are uh, two sectors that uh, did uh, pretty pretty um, poorly in the first quarter, consumer staples and REITs, but I just wanted to kind of focus that over time, the, the earnings in staples, and in this case, it's the Vanguard Consumer Staples Index, as uh, compared to the S&P 500, are, are pretty in line. So some of the uh, kind of doomsday trading in staples in the first quarter was really more a sector rotation and worry that, in our view, was excessive on, on the future of the industry, given uh, online sales and, and that sort of thing. But uh, that the reality of, of the earnings growth is that they're, they're pretty stable and pretty in line with uh, the market at large. And the forward PE at 16.6 times earnings um, is is reasonably attractive, especially uh, given where the market is right now. I guess you could argue that it was less attractive um, a year ago, six months ago, before Staples pulled in. Um, Hindsight being 2020, that that looks to be the case. But at this point, the valuation uh, of Staples is more attractive uh, uh, for sure. For sure, and in a similar matter, REITs, um, which were um, had a tough uh, trade in the first quarter, have, have definitely um, started to come off nicely off their lows. But you could see that over time, their price does uh, move uh, along with um, a cash flow per share, both trailing and forward. The cash flow per share of some REITs did slow a little bit and brought the overall sector down. Uh, Where we're trying to focus on are REITs that can grow their their cash flows and and thus their dividends um, uh, in the upcoming economic environment. There was a big REIT conference a couple weeks ago. Um, I was there. One of my analysts was there where we really – continue to focus on companies that, that again, it's the same team can grow their dividends and in this economic environment. So while REITs in particular, we actually put out a, a, a piece that uh, about a month ago that shows that the short-term effect can be pretty pronounced. I think it was uh, quite a bit pronounced this time around, but in the longer term, um, the, the, the correlation between the total return and rates just hasn't been there and that, in fact, these companies have done well in um, in better rate environments. So the first quarter did remind me a little bit of, say, the first quarter of 2013 with that rate worry when the tapering was going to be um, stopped. I think the market sort of digests it, it prices it in a little more, is a little more expecting of it, and then the stocks trade a little bit more on their fundamentals. Of course, having said that, I, I do reiterate that we are um, have made a move into dividend growth to, in addition, um, help uh, mitigate the effects of, of rising rates. So to weave the focus of those two uh, slides back into the theme, it's uh, we really want to first and foremost have a aggregate dividend stream that that is reliable that 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 in aggregate. One um, doesn't have to worry about cuts, and that from there can benefit from a growing environment that we're currently in um, and therefore have dividend growth that can drive this total return of, of 6 to 8%. Uh, percent. So with that, I will hand it over to the next speaker, Greg Kaplan. Great. Thank you, Dave, and hello, everyone. Um, shifting over to fixed income, um, Really, 2018 has been and will continue to be about rates and not credit. This is something we've been saying since January, and that's certainly still true. Um, The Fed is driving most of that narrative. They're currently more than halfway through their hiking cycle based on their own forecasts. We've got seven rate hikes behind us. And interestingly, long yields are a little changed, and I'll get to that more in a moment. Um, The Fed pushing up short-term rates has made um, short-term liquidity management and um, yields on the short end a lot more attractive uh, and quite viable. So I'll talk more about that. Um, And credit fundamentals pretty much across the board remain stable, um, reasonably healthy, um, certainly pockets here and there, evaluation questions, um, sector rotation and whatnot. But in general, that's been an area that's been uh, uh, a very good place to be. Um, So in terms of of our forecast, actually, I think Matt uh, touched on this earlier, Um, we are expecting two more Fed hikes this year. 
for a total of four. This is um, this is consistent with our view going back to the first quarter of this year, uh, and that remains on track. The market and the Fed have actually um, drifted slowly toward that view. Um, the most recent Fed meeting, uh, they have made that official. Um, but looking into 2019 is a little different. Um, uh, we are expecting two more rate hikes out of the Fed, where the Fed themselves are forecasting three. We're a little bit below consensus on that because we think the, the Fed is going to uh, face some headwinds next year that, that may cause them to pause. Um, in terms of the 10-year Treasury, um, Matt had mentioned that, that we have a slight bias, um, somewhat higher in rates, but not a dramatic move. Uh, relatively small. Uh, we think the additional deficit spending, which needs to be financed through the Treasury, uh, that supply is going to have a, um, a bias upward in rates. But most of that supply is really coming on the, the short end of the curve. Um, three, five, seven-year maturities is where we expect uh, most of that issuance. So 10-year move is going to be relatively muted. And then once you move out to 20- and 30-year maturities, uh, uh, we should you actually see very little pressure out there. So. Um, Again, uh, looking at, at um, where the Fed is so far, you can see on the graph here that, that um, seven hikes are behind us. Their own forecast takes the, the final um, Fed funds rate up around, um, around three and a half. And this is really important because, as Matt mentioned, when you look at the neutral rate, which is demonstrated here, so the blue line is the um, real Fed funds rate um, going all the way back to 1970 um, relative to the neutral rate, which is which is really a, um, uh, it's not a readily uh, observable rate. So that rate is, is somewhat theoretical, but you can observe it looking backward. And what you see here is that every single time the Fed raised rates past the neutral rate, it was soon after followed by recession. So if you look at where we are now over on the right, we are starting to approach it. And some would argue that we're probably about two or three hikes away. Um, uh, that's that's interesting, but, uh, you know, that's going to be hard to observe. Chairman Powell himself thinks the, the – you know, neutral is about 3%, which gives us room for, for another four hikes. Um, but the Fed has also made it clear that, that they plan on raising rates um, above neutral to restrictive territory. Um, so that has yet to be seen. We're not sure they're actually going to get there. The other thing you notice here is that the neutral rate is quite low relative to historical past. And as the economy gathers steam, as we see strength in the economy, the neutral rate naturally rises along with it. So the speed at which that rises along with Fed funds is really what has yet to be seen. Um, but we do think that's an increasing risk probably next year. Um, but speaking of the balance sheet, so it's not just about rates. It's really about the balance sheet as well. And it's not just about the Fed. It's about central banks around the globe. So the three key central banks, the Fed, the ECB, and the Bank of Japan, um, we think the, the the peak in terms of quantitative easing, bond buying, the size of the balance sheets is really past us, but only recently past us. And shrinkage going forward is going to be relatively modest. That's going to be led by the Fed, obviously, um, recent and announcement by the ECB suggests that they're going to start that path um, by the end of the year in terms of not buying new bonds but um, uh, and slowly starting to wind down their balance sheet. We'll see if they can actually do that. But but if you look at the three collectively, um, the peak is passed and the shrinkage is really being led by the Fed um, as they let bonds roll off instead of reinvesting. Um, that's another form of monetary tightening. So um, look at that along with the rate rises um, in terms of overall monetary policy. They still consider this removal of accommodation, not actual tightening, um, as, long as, as long as those two theoretical uh, constructs combined do not exceed the neutral rate. Um, so uh, we think it's still, um, uh, it's still positive for the economy. It's still positive for a lot of other markets. But interestingly, um, it's not rolling into longer-term yields because it's really a, a short to medium-term phenomena. Um, so in terms of longer-term yields, um, what I found really interesting is if you look back at, at the day that the Fed started uh, hiking, uh, December 15th of 2015 was the first move since the financial crisis. Um, the 30-year Treasury yield was a 305. And if you look at it, when I made this graph a couple of days ago, um, it was at a 305. Here, as I sit, 30-year Treasury is a 297. So long-term yields really haven't moved a whole lot. We've seen a lot of volatility, obviously, but the fundamental long-term view um, in terms of inflation, in terms of economic growth, real rates, uh, really hasn't moved a whole lot. And, and that speaks to why we're relatively sanguine about the longer end of the curve uh, in terms of assets that, that um, uh, 
that reside out there, um, not implying we want to be long duration within a certain strategy, but placement on the curve uh, certainly makes a difference. Um, for example, high yield muni as an asset class um, tends to be a long duration asset class. It's about the income. That has also seen volatility along with this, as you see in the graph. But if you look at the price return um, over the last three years, it's really uh, been flat. It's, you know, it, it's been all about the income. So. Um, Shifting back to the short end of the curve, as I mentioned, uh, liquidity management has been extremely attractive. We've seen um, a lot of interest there as, as a lot of financial intermediaries um, are lagging in terms of their rates on deposits and money market funds and things like that. We're seeing um, a lot of attraction to a separately managed account where you can take advantage of some of the yields. These are just three uh, benchmark curves. Uh, taxable equivalent on the muni side um, is that very volatile red line. Um, for a tax-sensitive investor, that, that has made an enormous amount of sense. But for taxable, uh, for tax-exempt investors buying taxable securities, uh, you know, with yields on those portfolios well north of two percent, uh, that's been you know a nice option, uh, and that will continue to trend along with the Fed, uh, and we think that's going to remain a nice place to be going forward. Um, Shifting to credit really quickly, uh, credit spreads, as we said, um, are, are, are relatively tight. Um, this is just a graph of U.S. corporate high yield uh, as alongside of emerging market high yield. You can see they're uh, relatively tracking each other. And dotted lines are the average going back to 2004. And you can see that we're tighter than average. Um, but if you strip out the extraordinary effects of the financial crisis, you know, really the averages uh, were not that far off. In fact, in some cases, in some cases, um, it's actually a bit higher. Uh, so I think that's reflective of a relatively healthy economic situation, you know, obviously here in the U.S., but also globally. Um, and we don't think that's going to change in the short to medium run, which is why we're still constructive on credit. Uh, municipals, same story. A um, little bit different way of looking at it. If I showed you spreads, it would look like a very similar graph to what I just showed you. But in terms of initial impairments, uh, that has also uh, uh, continued to trend down. That that whole sector has been um, improving dramatically ever since the financial crisis. Uh, and that certainly continues um, in spite of the headlines. We all know about Detroit. We all know about Puerto Rico. Um, but away from that, the core part of the municipal bond market has actually been quite healthy. So looking forward, um, again, expecting two more uh, two more rate hikes out of the Fed, um, two next year, which is below consensus. Uh, we think the, um, the yield curve will continue to flatten just based on the Fed pushing at the short end and, and lack of a, a significant material rise on the long end. Um, in fact, we think that's going to be, be probably range-bound. So the risk of, of curve inversion, which is typically a precursor to recession, um, certainly goes up next year, but it doesn't become uh, very material yet. Uh, we are certainly watching that very closely. Um, and, and in light of that fact, in light of the fact that long-term yields are relatively range-bound, uh, we think that investors should be looking at the long end of the curve uh, and not just blindly being short duration, because um, as the Fed raises rates, that doesn't speak to market rates, which, which is the way the long end of the curve is really determined. Uh, credit trends uh, remain stable, and then from a return standpoint, we continue to expect low to mid-single digit returns for investment grade fixed income and mid-single digits for non-investment grade um, looking through, you know, essentially 2018 into 19. So with that, um, let me pass it back to Matt. Great. Thanks, Greg, and thanks, everybody. I uh, really appreciate your sub uh, sub substantive updates uh, and um, I just want to weave together a theme that you heard from the team so far, which is that, again, we look at it through many different metrics and turn the prism, and it looks to us like uh, we're uh, all clear in terms of recession risk in the near term. And so that becomes very important as we look forward and we talk about the market and what are the market risks. So I'll try and assemble that for you now. In the uh, near term, if there's no recession, and by near term I mean 18 months or so, um, then typically that uh, puts the equity markets in reasonably good shape. As you'll see on this chart, and we've shown this in the past, uh, but outside of recessions, uh, it is, it, it's rare to see a bear market. So I wanted to put this back in front of you because it keeps us grounded in the sense that it can happen. There are corrections. Tom called out one we had earlier this year. Um, 
and there's, of course, noise, and we'll see more and more of that going forward, but the risk of an outright bear market uh, seems to be low at this stage, so that's why we're staying um, pretty well invested. One thing that's not getting as much attention that I wanted to spend a minute on is uh, a more subjective uh, or, I should say, qualitative uh, measure, and um, that is, are we seeing the massive fund flows and the euphoria that typically you see later on in the cycle. And that hasn't happened yet. We have not seen a lot of flows into equities. And you'll see from this the flows into equities rather tame. Um, and really, bonds still get the lion's share of the flows. So again, this isn't hard data. It's not something you can really hang your hat on. But um, there isn't really an, uh, there's more fear in the market, I think, at this point, which is in some sense healthy for the market. It keeps it it grounded, and, and uh, but when we start to see uh, euphoria, then that, that might be a signal that we're getting near the end. So again, that's just the contours of how uh, cycles typically work. Doesn't mean it, it will work that way, but uh, it's certainly something that uh, I wanted to flag for everybody. Okay, so let's come back to our forward-looking themes that we have. We've talked about this in the past, but returns going forward are just going to be more moderate uh, than, than we expect for a lot of the reasons that the team has outlined um, uh, earlier. And when we put it all together, look at where valuations are on a number of measures, contemporaneous measures such as current PE or the CAPE PE, the longer term 10-year cyclically adjusted PE, um, they all point to a more moderate return uh, outlook going forward, but still positive. So we want to keep that in mind, still positive and still better uh, than uh, many of the fixed income uh, alternatives we have. So um, we, we do want to stay invested here because, uh, but yet, as I'll talk about, uh, uh, fortify our positions and certainly keep our, our quality up. But uh, so theme number one, more moderate returns than we've had in the past. And then the bad news is, of course, higher volatility that we've seen this year, and we expect that to unfortunately continue. As this chart shows, uh, volatility this year has been, I would call it average, of what you would normally expect. It's, it's unusual versus what we've had over the past few years, but certainly well within historical norms. And you can see that from this, uh, this dot plots on the bottom here, how we're just right in line with um, where, where things have uh, been on average in terms of our drawdown, our maximum drawdown this year. So, Put it in context, as rough and tumultuous as this year has been, um, this is actually more normal and more what we expect to see going forward. Okay, um, I wanted to touch on our views outside the U.S. because um, it's important. Obviously, we're in a global world, and we do a lot of thinking about uh, all the, the markets outside the U.S. Our focus is on where we see the secular winners, where we see structural advantages across the globe and sort out the structural winners from losers. And we'll have a forthcoming uh, set of white papers on our outlook on both developed markets and emerging markets. But for many of you that know us, our longstanding view, which has been quite productive, has been to focus on where the growth is, where there's wind at your back from a demographics perspective as well as policies, population, et cetera. Um, and again, our paper will cover this in some detail. But uh, as we sharpen our pencil and look forward, uh, we think the next five and 10 years may be uh, similar to what we've seen in the past, which is that emerging markets, Asia, will really be the beneficiaries as they have a self-sustaining consumer economy, um, which is unlike what you see in, in other economies, uh, which are either much more dependent on commodity cycles or much more dependent, as the case in Europe, of external uh, forces beyond their effect and, of course, their own internal political dynamic um, is difficult. So um, for those reasons, we, we continue to focus on emerging markets Asia. Right now it's in a, um, a, a correction phase. And um, in, in some sense, if, depending on how severe that gets, uh, we see more opportunity there to establish longer term positions. In particular, EM credit right now is something we're doing a lot of work on, a lot of thinking there. And so you'll see more from us on that front. Um, but emerging markets Asia, for the reasons outlined in this slide, um, you really just need to know what's on the left, which is that uh, that's 
where the growth is in the economy that's outside the U.S. and actually more favorable than, than the U.S. So a secular positive view on emerging markets Asia, which we'll reaffirm in our paper. Okay, so our portfolio strategy, putting it all together, um, is again equities, uh, Tom outlined and David outlined our outlook for uh, continued earnings growth and dividend growth. Um, and that, at the end of the day, should drive uh, uh, equities higher. Valuations are fair, and as a result, um, especially if interest rates stay well contained, we do think that can happen. EM Asia I spoke about is a, is a key theme for us. Um, and we'll see some opportunities in European equities. We'll, we'll, we'll seize them when we see them. Those are more tactical, uh, but those opportunities will present itself. Um, so we will, we will um, continue to stay on um, uh, in tune with that. In uh, fixed income, Greg took us through his thinking there. Um, so I won't repeat that. You can see it on the page. But we are favoring opportunistic fixed income. We see more opportunities away from the, the core traditional areas of fixed income. So in bank loans, um, EM local currency uh, bonds, or EM even short duration emerging markets credit I mentioned is something we're doing work on and, and making uh, incremental allocations to. Um, so with that said, I uh, want to get us over to questions. Um, and uh, so I'll close on a couple of comments uh, uh, so I can save enough time for, for questions. And that is that here's our, our forecast page. Um, the green is where we're, we're focused on and where we're invested. Uh, and the red is something where we're underweight and less constructive on. But you still see a lot of positive numbers across the, states, uh, across the page. So that's positive for investors globally um, as capital markets are in relatively good shape. So I'll close just by saying that uh, we covered a lot of material today. It was quite a dense presentation. I hope it was helpful. Our portfolio managers, of course, participate in this process. They're fully up to speed, very thoughtful on these uh, issues and these matters. So by all means, if we went too fast on something or need a deeper dive, please reach out to them. They're uh, very thoughtful on these topics, and we benefit from their perspective, of course. Um, we also publish um, uh, regularly our market and economic perspectives, our on-the-radar uh, piece, as well as various other publications that are on our website. So with that, Suzanne, I'll turn it back to you. Yes, thanks, Matt. Thank you to all of our speakers for covering so much material so quickly. We have a few minutes left uh, for questions, so I'm going to start back off with equities. Uh, Tom, do you expect a downturn of 20% or more this year? What, what specifically, if anything, is worrying you? Uh, great uh, question. So as uh, Matt highlighted, the normal conditions for a 20% or more a la a bear market don't seem to be in place. Recession was so low. The Fed's not aggressively raising rates to combat rising inflation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, having said that, in a year where volatility should be rising, uh, the fact that there is an increased percentage of trading in equities driven by computers, algorithmic trading, momentum style factors, um, should the macro influences kind of create a you know, perfect storm for a moment of, uh, of uh, fear, um, then it, it can't be ruled out that we could have, you know, a mini flash crash. I don't think it's a high probability. But because of all these, you know, computer-based um, uh, trading systems, uh, systems that know what the price is of what they have, but they don't really know what the value is, and so uh, can't rule that out. I wouldn't give it a high probability. Uh, the fundamentals don't suggest that. Some of the things I'm keeping my eye on, um, beyond just you know whether we get into the worst case blown out uh, trade wars, uh, the, the the battle royale with the bombs and the nuclear missiles going off, uh, would 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 be if it's tech focused. If there's something happens to really throw off the tremendous growth and momentum in the tech sector, the supply chain cycle as flexible as Matt pointed out as it is, if there's something that would come along to kind of change those dynamics. Um, that could be a, a trigger because, you know, tech has been such a big a winner. And for uh, one uh, circumstance, I'm keeping my eye on what happens to ZTE, um, the uh, uh, Chinese organization that uh, is back and forth on whether we uh, sanction them or not sanction them. So uh, stay tuned. So uh, tech, algo, I think those things could be the factors. But outside of that, 
uh, do not see the circumstances for a 20% uh, a, uh, bear, bear market. Okay, thanks. Keeping an eye on tech, that's a, that's a good takeaway. Um, Matt, turning to you, I know you covered international markets in one of the slides. We did have a question specifically on that. I'm hoping you can do a slightly little deeper dive there. What markets specifically are doing well? Uh, which international markets do you expect will do well in the next, say, 12 to 36 months? Yeah, so the, you know, 12 months is tough to talk to uh, to forecast, especially for international markets. There are so many uh, cross currents. Um, so, but longer term, I think over the 36 months, I, I do think that um, EM Asia will continue to um, to re, to uh, have that self-sustaining uh, organic growth that I spoke about. A healthy consumer economy, et cetera. So I think the first, we're watching the credit markets there closely. We're looking at everything from sovereign CDS spreads to um, corporate credit there, trying to sort out what's fundamental and what's just really contagion from the rest of the world and the rising dollar and how their uh, earnings will uh, hold up in in the face of these macro headwinds that they're, uh, that they're uh, working through. So you know, the taper tantrum uh, a few years ago was, did actually give them a fire drill to prepare for this now. So, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see their uh, fundamental sensitivity to a lot of these macro variables um, uh, now to see how much improvement they have made, and that could create opportunity. So, and we'll, our first foray there will probably be an increased exposure to EM Asia credit. Okay, okay EM Asia credit is the takeaway there. Did yeah. I hear you right? That, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was a long Great. way of saying that. Thank you, Suzanne. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, just want to make sure I was hearing, hearing it correctly. We only have a few minutes left. Um, Dave, a thoughts on dividend stocks or other bond proxies, especially given this rising rate <clears throat> environment going forward? Yeah, I mean, again, that that is uh, a, a question that's – Really, it's been um, kind of been asked. It's uh, really been on the radar going back a few years now, and it it really highlighted um, the beginning of the year when rates um, made I, you know, a little bit of a quicker move upward than people expected, and and dividend stocks were um, hit uh, particularly hard. I think that given the fact that where our expectations of rates are. Um, for instance, that we don't think that the 10 years is get, getting higher than, say, three and a half uh, over the intermediate future, um, coupled with um, the, the strength in the economy, gives us confidence of where we're at in the portfolio. But then, again, and, and then, of course, is the whole aspect of, of a rising uh, dividend yield. And so, um, and that graph, which highlighted it, we're aiming four to seven. Um, say, be conservative even on the higher end, say 5% over the next five years, that's uh, going to be 28% higher uh, dividends uh, for those same stocks than they are now. And we really feel that that um, will, will mitigate the effect. And I think given the fact that rates have made a move and the market was a, a bit volatile and, and has settled down from it, um, it's, a, it's a little more... I would say priced in this go around, but having said that, the the really the 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 main thing you can do is to just get more uh, more growth and have the the stocks trade call it less bond like and more stock like. Got it. So hoping for more growth from you, right? Yes. Um, great, um, Matt. The speedometers. Um, and they are newly designed. Thank you for that shout out. Um, are they expected to shift during third or fourth quarter? Uh, and if so, what indicators would, would cause you to have a more bearish approach? I mean, everything we heard here today was somewhat positive, right? So anything out there that would, that would cause a more bearish approach? Yes. And uh, thanks again to our crack marketing team. Great team. We're lucky to have. <laughs> Or new, cool-looking speedometers, less geekified than ours. Okay, uh, we only have a short time. If it's okay, I'm going to join that with the, another question I see in the queue, which is around the shape of the yield curve. So I'll kind of hit those yes, both. Yes, thank you. Three, I want a minute. So uh, with the speedometers, um, yes, they will turn. They will flip from yellow to, to red, and that's the progression, and that's the ones we're going to track. So very quickly, what, we're, what, what I expect to happen is probably this cycle will be a corporate debt cycle. 
as opposed to a balance sheet recession we had in 2008, which is much more severe. So if it's a corporate debt cycle, what they call an inventory recession, sometimes we'll expect to see that uh, those indicators flip in corporate debt. We're already seeing a buildup in small cap debt, um, and that could that could uh, be a problem for us, and certainly in certain sectors. We saw a little bit of that in late 2015. Coming to the yield curve question, is the yield curve flattening uh, to be, um, you know, concerning? I think Greg touched on this a little bit. It is also the natural progression of the cycle. Um, as rate hikes go up, you'll, as rate hikes happen, you will see flattening. Equity markets typically do quite well, uh, or at least okay, during um, uh, flattening yield curve regimes. So uh, that's why we want to stay invested. When they invert, uh, that's typically when you have a stronger signal. So flattening, not necessarily bad. Inversion, that's when we'll really pay attention. Of course, you want to know, are we flattening before we invert? That could, that's going to happen, but are we, are we close at that point yet? We don't think so. So again, we think there's, there's time to run. Back to you, Suzanne. I think we are at 11 o'clock, so what I'll do is uh, close us out here. Um, it's probably my turn to close us out. So thank you, everybody, for joining. We hope you found it helpful. Uh, it's 11.01, so we'll let you get back to your day. And thank you uh, on the West Coast, I'm sorry. And we'll let you get back to your day, and have a great day. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone.